Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I love it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, all over campus, you have noticed a new message. Let's build a campus community together where you know you belong. To understand why EDI thought it was so important to launch celebrating you completely this year, it's necessary to talk a bit about where the platform comes from and what issues or trends is meant to address. Everywhere we look, from social media to politics and from our neighborhoods to workplaces and schools, we see calls to come together to resist the division and isolation of technology and political rancor and to heal our communities by reaffirming the bonds that we share. We know what happens if we don't heed these calls. Earlier this spring, the Surgeon General's report targeted the nation's academic of loneliness, calling it an unacknowledged health crisis. Several organizations have pointed to the impact that the shutdown has, led on, has had on young people and the effects that it have, that is having even months and years after it has ended. And we've witnessed the various symptoms of social disintegration from increased rates of depression and anxiety to growing problems in substance use and social withdrawal. But as our panelists today will discuss, there are steps we can take to remedy the, the situation. And the reasons for doing so go beyond merely not wanting to suffer the consequences of ignoring it. As we hear a little bit today, there is genuine joy in belonging in being connected to our communities, woven into the fabric of our families, workplaces, and friends and networks. Psychologists identify belonging as a basic human need, as fundamental as the need for shelter and food, and say that when we feel connected, we perform better, we sleep and eat better, and we're more resilient so we can better handle challenges and fight off sicknesses or bouts of disappointment. That's why the challenging, mm -mm. that's why the celebrating you community, mm -mm. let me pause. <laughs> why am I rushing? I apologize. Let me pause. Mm. That's why the celebrating you completely platform invites all of us to celebrate all our unique characteristics across multiple backgrounds, beliefs, and experiences. Promote the positive contributions of every student, faculty, trainee, and staff person at the U. And affirm our differences by acknowledging our challenges and rooting ourselves in our shared humanity to foster a welcoming campus climate where every individual knows they belong. Every individual knows they belong. So today we're going to explore with our panelists the different ways we can help make that happen through the choices we make, the attitudes we adopt, and the practices we employ. Uh, I do want to acknowledge Heather and Jennifer who will be uh, signing for us today. So thank you for being in this space. Our first panelist today is C.J. Drizm, founder and CEO of Utah Creative Chamber and Changing Lanes Entertainment Group. Born in Linwood, California, C.J. grew up in Compton, the eldest of four brothers. He attended Cal State University of Long Beach, where he pursued a degree in vocal performance. 
Today, he is a sought-after act in high-end event scenes. He's been nominated for a Grammy and has performed on stages across the U.S. and abroad for more than 20 years. Speaking about his own positive worldview, CJ says, this dreamer, with his heart attuned to the rhythm of possibilities, refuses to accept the limits that others seek to impose. C.J. Drizzle. Our second panelist is Dr. Julia DeSera, Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in the College of Health. Dr. Lucera is an associate professor in the Department of Health and Kinesiology. I practice that word. <laughs> Kinesiology, whose research is focused on health inequalities, inequities, diversity and inclusion, and implementation science. Using a community-engaged research framework, Dr. Lucera strives to achieve health equity by means of education, research, and policy development. She is committed to the notion that through the identification of modifiable social determinants, community academic partnership can reduce the burden of health inequities experienced by underrepresented populations. Dr. Lucy, Lucera. <laughs> Dr. Julie. Lucero. Names are so important. I apologize, Dr. Lucero. And last but certainly not least, our third panelist today is Jack O'Leary, the 2023-24 student body president of ASUU, Associate Students of the University of Utah. Jack is a senior undergraduate student majoring in honors economics and political science with an emphasis in pre-law at the College of Social and Behavior Science. Heavily involved across campus throughout his time at the U, Jack has, been, has held leadership positions in prior ASUU administrations and been involved in various campus organizations, including Ivory Innovations, the Daily Utah Chronicle, the Business Economic Society, the Sigma Chi Fraternity, and many others. Born and raised in Chicago, Jack is now proud to call Utah home and is grateful for the involvement opportunities that allowed him to find his passion, purpose, and people here at the U. Do you want me to repeat that? Okay, his passion, <laughs> his purpose, and people here at the U. O'Leary and his team want members of our campus community to trust in the meaning of positive change, to be empowered to succeed on this campus, feel a sense of belonging, and have a unique, life-changing college experience. Jack O'Leary. <laughs> yes. Uh, so welcome to our panelists today. Uh, Jack, I'm going to start the questioning with you, sure. the conversation with you. Uh, your introduction gives us a perfect place to start today's discussion. In your bio, you mentioned positive change, a sense of belonging, and life-changing college experience, all of which feels very upbeat and encouraging. Mm -hmm, I like that. Uh, I want to make sure that we spend some time today with that positive change. But I also know you are part of that generation of students who feel directly the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the shutdown. You were in your first year of college in 2020, is that right? Yes. That's right, yep. that's right. Uh, we're only now beginning to understand the long-term effects of that event on the young people who went through it. Can you talk about your experience and how it affected you and your sense of connection to those around you? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll start and say, I, uh, so f back in high school when I was growing up, um, I've always been one to, to get involved in my community. Um, my dad was a hockey coach and my mom was a public schools teacher. So um, it was just kind of in the family. It's, it's what you did, you went and got involved. And so coming to college, that was something I wanted to continue. 
Um, but campus was very strange. It was, I was living in Callard Village at the time, and there was only, there was only freshmen on campus, so campus was, was, was empty. There was really nothing going on. There was no one around. Um, you really, the only friends you, you could make were your sweet mates, your dorm mates, if, and hopefully you got along with them, because if you didn't, there was really no one else. You couldn't eat in the cafeterias. You had to eat in your dorm room or, or in the, um, the shared community space. There were no clubs. There was no sports. There was no, there was really nothing. It was you're, you're in your, it was weird. You're in your dorm room and you're, you're, you're taking class online, unless you were one of the few in some of those lectures that were in person. So it was very empty. Um, and I didn't think it'd be that way. I know a lot of folks chose to defer college a year. Um, you know, we, we, we thought that back in senior year of high school that the pandemic might be over by then. Um, <laughs> I guess it wasn't, as we learned. Um, but yeah, it was very empty and it was very lonely. And so it was very, very hard to make those really important friendships, those important connections, that when you, you become a freshman that you're supposed to engage with your professors, engage with those around you get involved, and it really, you really couldn't. Um, for me, I went and joined the newspaper. I, I, I sought out um, working in student government, joining our first year council. Um, but I, I guess I kind of had an advantage because I was someone that really wanted to be involved and it was something I'd always done. Um, but for those that may have had a harder time or those that didn't know what they wanted to do, there was really, there was really no opportunity to go do so. Um, and you said those those words, uh, empty and, and lonely and disconnected. Anybody else during that era was online and you were making all of the decisions in a little box? You, you were there, yes? Yes. So you can relate to what Jack is saying or what that felt like during that particular time. But here you are now on campus. Oh, that's just Klaus. Uh, Round of applause, you're here on campus. You, you, you're making those connections, you're here on campus. You're creating community, is what Jack has said. How do you create community? You have to want to create that. So thank you, Jack, for sharing that information. Uh, so just as a follow-up with uh, Dr. Lucero and, and CJ, do you mind sharing a little bit about your own experience in healthcare, education, and entertainment? I, I guess for both of you, uh, the pandemic caused a pretty serious interruption in your sense of belonging and connection to the community. So is, is, is that right? You, you all want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, so hi everybody. Thanks for having us. Your pizza sp smells fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for me, so I um, have to just say that I am not a, a medical doctor, so I am not involved in health care. Um, so what I end up doing is working, um, doing research with community and also being an educator. So the same experiences with um, education in the classroom, everything moved to online learning. Um, I'm an introvert, so for me, you know, being home and being behind a computer was just okay. But I also don't have kids, and I know that that had a major, major implication. It changed sort of the fabric of, of the entire, um, you know, being at home, being behind the screen. Um, but for my research, it really did impact, because I do community-engaged research, so partners, I partner with community organizations and with community members. And um, I work with um, Latino and Native American primarily. And so when we moved to Zoom, suddenly it was, what in the world is this Zoom thing and how do I gain access to it? And so it really put a, a, a halt to a lot of um, progress on, on grants and um, what we were trying to accomplish. And instead it shifted to, I need internet connection, I need a computer, I need um, tutors for my kids, I need resources. Um, and I was living in Nevada at that time in Reno and they had this, the industry, the entertainment industry just shut down. And so a lot of the people that I was working with all of a sudden didn't have income. They lost their jobs. Um, you would have one family member that would go to work and they would live out in the garage for you know, long periods of time. So it really did um, impact a community that, that came together to, to have that social connection. Suddenly, you know, families were staying just with families and there wasn't that extended connection anymore. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood beautiful day to have a neighbor and thank you guys for having me uh, Miss Emma Houston uh, to the faculty here 
Um, I am so grateful to uh, have something to say and to be here uh, during this time. Uh, I've had friends who didn't make it past COVID. Um, I've had friends who decided to take their lives uh, during COVID, musician friends who were so interrupted by um, a friend named Brooks Hyatt. Um, God bless him. Uh, he would come, and I, you know, during that time, I, I realized like how important, you know, what your words are to people. You know, people hold on to your words, so uh, words are uh, captivating. Words can also destroy. Um, you know, uh, the Bible, which I read, says life and death is in the power of the tongue, and so we gotta, we get to, um, you know, be careful what we say, um, be careful how we do, be careful what we, how we move. You know. Um, and so, um, you know, during COVID time, I, <laughs> I was disobedient to the rules uh, that were set because I'm an entertainer, you know, but I'm also an introvert, like Dr. Lucero was saying, um, and uh, kind of like an ambivert, you know, I extrovert myself when I have to, and then I go in my shell like a Ninja Turtle, uh, <laughs> you know, am I wearing Ninja Turtles today? No. Um, that was yesterday. So, salute. Um, so... I, uh, I extrovert myself when I have to or get to to go and perform and things like that. But I need to have that space. I need to be clear. Uh, during COVID, I lost, my company lost well over uh, $800,000 um, worth of uh, gigs, shows, you know. Uh, we perform all over the country. And, uh, and I had to tell my clients, um, no, they called me and told me, <laughs> uh, hey, we're going to cancel. And so uh, can you send us our money back? Uh, then there were some people who called and said, you know, it's a hard time. You can go ahead and keep that money. We know you're going to need it. Uh, we don't know how long this is going to be. They knew I have a family and things like that, so they were, like, you know, really kind to uh, the organization. But um, very tricky. Um, and then, uh, you know, everybody knew I had this space called Lake House Studios, and so they would come in to <laughs> come into the space and be like, can we just hang out here? And I'm like, sure, you know, uh, y'all can hang out over there because, you know, uh, I got to be back here. But um, so much time <clears throat> spent giving people life, you know. Um, there are people who want to, right, um, to do good and to be out in community and things. And then there are people who have the ability to but don't want to. And so what I'm noticing is that the people who... <clears throat> The people who want to are now all of a sudden uh, gaining the ability to do so, right? Um, because there's so many able-bodied people who are unwilling. And so I'm challenging everybody in here today. You know, if you're one of those people who can do something, find a yes. Hey, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that that looked, sound like there was a trend going on in regards to the change and the dynamics that occurred during our COVID pandemic with families and friends and finances. And the introverts were like, yes, I'm happy. I, I can be in my den, I can be in my slippers, I can do that. But the, the extroverts were like, when is this going to be over? I need to make connections with my people. What, what is going on here? So knowing that it had a tremendous toll on us in different ways, what we're talking about here at the University of Utah is that you completely belong here to create community. Wherever you show up, you are supposed to be there in your full self. And the University of Utah is creating this particular space for that. But thank you all for sharing those COVID experiences. Uh, Ju no, I, I'm gonna, I almost said Julie. I'm gonna, I, I am so aware of titles, and I want to respect titles as well. But Julie, it's okay? Yes. All right, Julie. Uh, I think in general, we're treated emotional well-being as less critical overall than our physical health. Uh, I'm sure part of this was necessary, but in the middle of the pandemic in 2020 was like triage care. We were focused on just what we needed to do to keep folks alive. And we had to put aside issues like belonging until more recently. Uh, but a number of reports now indicate that the social and emotional impact of the pandemic has been huge. And the chronic illnesses that some Americans still feel is, profi is profound. Uh, one study even suggested it is as dangerous as smoking 15 cigarettes a day 
and increasing the risk of premature mortality in some groups by as much as 30%. Uh, those are astounding numbers. Can you talk about what you're finding in the field of medicine and healthcare? Are, are people beginning to assess the issues of belonging and emotional well-being, and if so, how? So, um, I my research is focused on social and behavioral, so not necessarily the biologic. And so, about two decades ago, there is a man named Robert Putnam that wrote a book that called Bowling Alone, and the premise of it was that in American history, there's been a social connection, and then over time, you've started to see the isolation of certain communities um, or people within American culture. And so way back then, as they started to identify loneliness and social isolation as a risk factor for health outcomes. And then sort of, um, you know, mental health, as we all know, has really been a touchy subject until um, the direct-to-consumer marketing of drugs started to come out. And then it became a topic that you saw regularly on the television. And so it created an opportunity for folks to talk about it and become more open but it still had a lot of stigma that was associated with it. And then we come to COVID, right? And all of a sudden, everybody is very acutely aware of how important mental health is. And no longer is there this, at least in the general sense, uh, dichotomy of the emotional or mental and physical. Instead, there was an understanding that there's a connection between the two. Um, so there has been a lot more emphasis on loneliness, social isolation within the social and behavioral health research. And so that's public health, that's um, sociology, that's health psychology, um, and the list goes on and on. In medicine, um, there's always been a knowledge that those that are suffering from mental health issues seek help from emergency care which is not the best way to go because med medical emergency services are always so overwhelmed. And so physicians at that point can do very little, um, but they try, right? There's always the, the questionnaire, um, you know, when you go to your, your primary care, if you're experiencing some symptoms of depression, you know, they ask you those sets of questions. So there's more and more um, awareness of mental health issues, social isolation, loneliness, um, but we can't, in my opinion, we can't um, just solely have one discipline that's looking at it. Instead, there really should be like a circle of care type of a situation where we have um, a lot of folks that are looking out, and that includes um, our family members, our friends, right, just to increase the awareness of what is happening around this issue. Um, I had a conversation with a colleague the other day. I said, how are you doing? And a colleague said, I'm fine. <laughs> and walked away. I followed the colleague to the, their office. And I stood in their door. And I said, how are you doing? And the colleague said, one of my best friends just lost their mother. How many of us take the next step? Because sometimes you can say, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine, I, I'm, I'm fine. But we know our friends, we know our families, we know what fine can be, how it can be interpreted. Do we just wanna take that one moment and follow someone and say, really, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Just take that moment to build community and connection. And I think that's what you're saying Julie, is how do you do that when someone says, I'm fine? Are we connected enough to know exactly what fine is? You want to talk about that? That's, a, that's not on the script. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, you know, it's this fine line between us being disconnected from each other um, and not wanting to feel like you're getting in somebody's business, right? Um, and so where is that, that balance? And I'm not entirely sure you know, what that looks like. I think you know, each individual has that um, personal boundary um, with you know, how far they're gonna go. Um, but I will say one thing, the, the belonging really is an active process. And so it's not only you know, the, the individual ha is a part of it, so that they're seeking out a place where they can fit, but it's also the institution, the organization, the community's responsibility to create that space for a person to feel like they can bring their whole selves 
um, into, into a place. And you know, there's this research study that I absolutely love, and they, they look at a university setting, it's just one setting, and they go to these various locations on campus to see really who belongs there, the visualizations of who belongs in a space, right? And so that's really something that is easily remedied um, but we have to have the forethought and able to, to be able to do that, right? That active process of creating that that space where a person can feel like they can take that extra step to um, try to belong, instead of fitting in, right? Sorry, just had to put that in. The fitting in, I mean, there's all kinds of things wrong with that. Uh, community is so important in these discussions, and CJ. You work with music. Your work and music has been a force in Salt Lake uh, for more than two decades. Uh, I wonder if you can talk to us about how you go about building belonging in the community, whether it's through your nonprofit organization, the Utah Creative Chamber, or at any of your many shows. Anybody seen CJ in concert? <laughs> oh, yes. Anybody seen CJ? I'm just saying. Okay, what is it that you look for uh, in a group? Do you notice certain things when it seems a community or group needs support or to be brought together in some way? Uh, and how do you go about building that bond so that everyone feels like they have a meaningful experience and feel that connection? You know, I was watching this, thank you. Um, I was watching this movie called Changing Lanes, right? You guys ever seen that movie? Yeah, Samuel Jackson, Ben Affleck, right? Um, and uh, and so I was. We were downstairs, and it was Courtney Smith, um, who's now gone on. He was a, a student here at the University of Utah, uh, one of my best friends and my brother. Um, and so we're downstairs. I'm like, you know, uh, we should call the band Changing Lanes. And uh, he was like, that's that's not a bad name. <clears throat> and uh, and I said, Changing Lanes changes lives. And I didn't want to be known as just the average party band, right? The people who just go in, they just make the money and they leave, right? I wanted people to have an experience. I want people to walk away feeling like, wow, they gave me so much more than what we paid for. Um, there was a guy who, uh, by the name, he used to host Park City TV by the name of Terry Burden. And, um, and so we get up there, and Terry became a lifelong friend of mine. And uh, so we get up there, he said, you know, um, and he said, you know, I'm, I, I grew up, you know, in a Catholic, you know, church, and my mom, you know, pushed the, you know, the, uh, you know, church stuff, religion on me. And, uh, and he said, you know, uh, I, I believe that, he said, now, you know, I just don't, you know, I don't do the religion stuff. And, and uh, we had that conversation. And it was, it was more of like, hey, man, I believe that people hire you because you guys have spirit, you know, and we love to to see the um, the building up of community through the Change Lanes organization and how you guys seek to not just play at people, but you play to and with and for, and um, and so that that was really like that spoke volumes to me because oftentimes we go out unintentional, you know. And I think that we just focus on what our motivation is. Um, and you know, when I'm p selecting people, I'm not selecting people who don't want to or are just, hey man, how much we make it, you know? <laughs> um, and that's cool. We gotta feed our families and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not, I'm not selecting people based off of, you know, monetary, you know, need. I'm, I'm selecting people that are going to make you feel something when you leave. Um, so when we're picking the songs even, we're not choosing songs that are going to be, you know, uh, uh, talking badly about women or, um, you know, uh, making, you know, suggestions of things that we don't agree with or uh, things like that. Um, we literally, the foundation of Changing Lanes Entertainment Group, the Utah Creative Chamber, is love. A praying church ought to say amen. amen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we say anyway. Um, you know, love. And love conquers all things. Um, love destroys hate. If love is in the room, you can't, you can't literally, you literally cannot hate in a place of love. Uh, you literally cannot hate in a place of joy. Um, and I know happiness is temporal and all that, but joy is something that you, something that cannot be taken away from you, even if you're sad. 
you know? And so, like, we were talking about with the, you know, um, you know, what's the extra step? It's just caring more. Um, it's caring more. It's literally just going out to say, you know what? I care about you. I'm going to say something a little additional to what, you know, uh, I asked before. I think the thing is, is that we're afraid of what the answer is going to be because of our capacity, right? Um, they may ask me to help them move today. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, they, may, they may say, man, like, you know, something really depressing, and you might be going through something too, and you can't, you know, um, you know, sustain that, you know, extra little bit of grief or whatever the thing is. And so sometimes it's, it's within us. And so um, maybe, um, maybe we just take those, um, you know, those extra, extra steps and say, you know what, I love you. I don't have the capacity to do anything for you at this moment, but I love you, and, and maybe let that be enough for the moment, you know, because then they'll feel safe around you. They're like, you know what, I remember you said you love me. You know, I remember that. And then they'll may, they may or may not come back to you, but maybe they might also just go to somebody that they actually can trust because they feel like somebody's looking at them. I've learned that people want to be heard. These are my, my alliteration. I like your alliteration. <laughs> people want to be heard. And then after they're heard, they want to be helped, right? And so if you, if you create this safe space where people can be heard and helped, right, then they will heal. And that's what the world needs. We just need more healing, you know? We need more, more uh, uh, you know, to be delivered from the things that have been hurting us and, and keeping us, you know, down, you know? So hear people, listen to them. If you can do something about it or send them to somebody, Send them, you know, or do something. Um, and then once they feel safe enough and once they feel like, man, this is a, a, a rotation of something different than what I'm normally used to, you know. Normally I'm telling people my business and then they don't do anything about it, you know. Um, normally I'm sharing my, my close informa my information and then no help is provided for me, you know. So why am I going to keep sharing? Why am I going to keep giving and giving and giving more of myself and I'm just feel empty. Who's there to fill me up? Who's there to help me get past through the next step? You know? Um, and that's what creates the healing process. You know, healing is a process. You know, um, just like trusting someone is a process. You know, healing is a process. And so if we can, you know, do, if we can, man, this will be amazing because people will be like so, so rejuvenated and, you know, right now, I want to do, and this is not on script, excuse me. Um, uh, but what I, what I need y'all to do is put your pens and your papers down for a second, right? And I don't know if it, it's been a long time since it's happened to me, so I'm going to just do it right now. Y'all give a hand to yourselves. <laughs> now, that's, now that's cute. <laughs> that's cute if that's for me, right? But clap for yourselves right now. That's different. I mean, that, that, you know what I mean? That's cool. The man asks us to clap for ourselves, and this is the way I feel about myself. <laughs> Am I saying something in here? Clap for yourselves right now. Go oh, as long as you want to. It was a long time, it was a very long time before somebody clapped for me like that. But if you lead with clapping for yourself like that, you're showing people how to treat you. You're showing people how to treat you. So if you don't clap for yourself ever, Okay, we can just leave now, right? We can just <laughs> call that a day with uh, clap for yourself. Uh, that is, that is so, so important, knowing that when you show up, that you're supposed to be there and that you celebrate you in any and every way possible. So thank you, CJ, for sharing that. We're talking about changing lanes and changing lives, and we're talking about being heard, being helped on the way towards healing. So thank you uh, for that. One big part of the work that we will be doing here at the University of Utah over the next two years 
uh, involves a partnership with Interfaith America, which will help us to cultivate collaborative efforts and understanding that brings together various communities and facilitates cooperation and connection. Uh, Julie, I wonder if you can talk about this in the context of public education research or medicine, the need to bring together diverse perspectives, backgrounds, areas of specialization in order to build stronger and healthier communities and find better solutions to some of our biggest problems. Um, so I come from the um, belief that the voices of the oppressed um, need to come to the table, need to be elevated in order for us to find the solutions to our worst problems. And that typically um, doesn't happen. And there's a, t a type of research, community-engaged research, that um, tries to, 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 to facilitate that, I guess. Um, but there's a lot of things that need to happen in between in order for community to um, be willing to share what they believe is, is their truth, right? So um, one, I mean the, okay, I'll, 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 I'll step away from my criticism of, of traditional research, um, but just to say that the more diversity that we have at the table, I mean, we know there's, there's years and years, decades of research that says that it provides um, more innovation, that there's more collaboration, you know, only good, I mean, there's definitely conflict that happens when you bring different folks to the table, but it's temporary. Conflict isn't a bad thing. Conflict is, is an opportunity to get over a barrier, an obstacle, and then you start to really have conversations. So, um, <laughs> No, no. <laughs> um, so then the disciplines are exactly the same thing. I mean, traditionally, we've been very isolated. We, we function in our silos, but everything is connected. I mean, I do public health research, and I know that um, education is a, is a factor, a risk or protective factor for health. I know that society and community is. I know that public policy is part of that. So it's all connected. So if we can all work together, different disciplines along with community, then you know we're, we're get, gonna get closer to the biggest societal problems. And that's really the, the philosophy that I ground my research in. So I, I can talk about this all day. I can, sh I can share my opinions all day. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, and, and what you had mentioned, bringing voices to the table. I'm gonna ask a question in a show of hands. Who was born and raised in the state of Utah? Look around the room, look around the room. Uh, born and raised in the state of Texas. Raise it high, raise it high, raise it high. Dallas? Uh, Lubbock. Lubbock. Brownsville. Brownsville, Texas, I'm just saying. Dallas, <laughs> Cowboys for life, but anyway. Uh, Nevada. Look around the room. California. Hello. Okay, New Jersey. Pennsylvania. Atlanta, Georgia. New Mexico. International. Okay, New Mexico. International. International. Look around the room. And yet we are all here in the state of Utah at this moment. It would take too much time for me to name all 50 states, but you know where you were born and raised, right? The commonalities that we have, when we talk about diversity, we look around the room, this is diversity. This is diversity. What do we have in common? How do we build a community of belonging with our commonalities? So when we talk about diversity, we're not just talking about the physical exterior of diversity. We're talking about all that we bring, all those voices to the table brings those diverse perspectives to build a community of inclusivity and belonging. So thank you. Voices are so important. Uh, so CJ and Jack, uh, are you able to share your own views about the importance of bringing folks together across political, racial, economic, and musical differences? Listen, give me some, no, I don't even know. <laughs> I'm just gonna say, okay. Uh, what are the challenges when you seek to build those bridges between different people and groups? And what are the victories when you succeed? Yeah, um, big question, but I'll, first start, I wanted to touch on just uh, something CJ said about when you hear people. 
um, and how you do that. I uh, just it's it's really basic, but I uh, you know I was I picked up a friend of mine from the train station. And we're talking like, hey, you know what's up? Like, what are you doing? Like, why were you down in Orem? Like, what you know, um, come back up and um, start. You know, so he started talking. I could tell like he you know wanted to share something. And I was like, hey, like you know what's like you seem off. Like, what's are you okay? Like, what's going on? And he just started crying. I was like, whoa. Uh, so I pull over, you know, on a side street, and he just like he just let all this out, and I was like, wow, okay. And I just sat there for like five minutes, listening. Um, and and we, we're we're really close friends, and but I, I felt just I felt a new bond kind of form from just being sitting there listening and and trying to recognize, okay, this you know when I ask like what what does that look like? Like how are you actually doing? Um, so even if it's just basic questions like that, that is just so so important, not just. For that other person, so that they can share, but but for you also to learn, you know, what is it? How can you better identify how you're feeling? But how can you better identify how you can help others? So I just I wanted to, I, I loved when you, when you said that, and that's so important. Um, listening is also, you know, a lot of the time we listen uh, when you're in class, or you're in a debate or a discussion, you listen to respond. You know, you're you're not listening to. Um, hear what they're actually saying. You're, you're sitting there going, oh wait, I've got a better point. Let me, I want to share my opinion here. My opinion's better. Um, but in, and I think listening, number one, that's a really key aspect of when you're trying to bring anyone to the table, when you're trying to, to bridge those divides, just sometimes that can be the easiest way to increase your understanding. Um, the other point, the other thing I want to touch on though is when you're, when you're, when you're trying to, a lot of the times we see, uh, in student, I'll, I'll touch on student, student government, uh, we're trying to advance initiatives or we're trying to advance projects or, or, or programs, whether it's as simple as we're trying to get a tabling event or you know, we're trying to change how public transit and parking works at the university. Um, it, it, when you're having those conversations, you, you need to get a variety of ideas and a variety of perspectives. Um, we have 35,000 students plus Ten, you know the other couple thousands of, of staff and faculty and, and visitors we have on campus. And if you're trying to come up with a solution that impacts everybody, you have to try to get as much perspective as you can. Because there are, there are plenty of things that, that I'm not going to know or I'm not going to think about that someone else will be thinking about. Um, and the, the part I, I, I put in my bio and one thing I try to do is positive change. What, what does that mean? Um, Really, you know, if you want to invite that perspective, you also need to be willing to invite uh, disagreement, but positive disagreement. And that sounds kind of like it might not go together, positive disagreement, kind of an oxymoron, right? Um, but really, it's if you're, if you're not disagreeing, you're not going to figure out, OK, what do we actually need or what do we think we need? And how can we come to a compromise or come to a solution that works better for everybody? Um, because you're not, you're not going to always agree. And, and I'm of the belief that I don't want to agree with everybody. Because if I'm, if I'm sitting here in a room with 50 people, and I put out an idea, and we all agree on it, well, OK, what are we actually doing? Like, did that, is, is there feedback for that? Do we like it? Do we not like it? Do we want to change it? How can we make it better? Um, so without that discussion, without that disagreement, without that, um, more importantly, though, without that willingness to engage and the willingness to listen, we're not going to actually succeed if we bring people to the table. <laughs> really good. <laughs> I didn't follow with that. Put your pens and papers down. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Put your pen and papers down. Here's what I want y'all to do. I want y'all... Now, how many people want change? Want change. Yeah, right? You want change. Clap for the change that you want. At all? We should be rattling the building right now. <laughs> Come on, clap for the change that you want. Y'all good, y'all good. Y'all could be in the choir. So what I was thinking as Jack was talking is about do what you want to see. Oftentimes people are, they don't believe that change will actually happen. Well, you're right. Change won't just happen. You got to do it. You make change. So just like you make a pot of gumbo in Louisiana, not here in Utah, just in Louisiana or something, you know, New Orleans or something. Uh, but you make change. 
Um, you put you put the, the pen to the paper, you write it down, and then you start putting checks in the box about the things that you would like to see different, right? And then you gather yourself around the people who also want to see the same type of change, and then you make the change happen, you know? Um, you also gather yourself with the people who don't necessarily understand that these things need to change, and then you get uncomfortable first, you know, because comfort doesn't come from just agreeing with, like Jack was saying, you got to get uncomfortable first. You got to have the hard conversations. You get to, actually. That's the other point. Change the got to's to get to's. I get to go outside and I get to go out. I get to go inside and I get to go to the hospital and I get to go. You feel me? Like, that's it. So we got to change our got to's to get to's. We get to love one another. And if we start with love first, literally it doesn't cloud anything else in our minds, you know, because we're not thinking about what the person looks like, what the different race or religion or gender or anything that, that the world tries to use as a distraction. It's a distraction. All of these panelists have dropped some golden nuggets, uh, some tips, some tools, some techniques to take away. Uh, if nothing else, when you, no time to hate, no time to hate on the back of his phone. Uh, if, if nothing else, what you do when you walk out on campus, and if you put your hands together as you're walking across campus and start clapping, people are gonna say, what are you clapping? I'm clapping for me. I'm clapping, I got that test coming up and I just need to woo, encourage myself. I'm clapping for me. So you all could create a train across campus just clapping along oh, the way. Hashtag though, hashtag me though. Oh, <laughs> You know, the social media, you know what I'm saying? So the fact that they have shared some tips, some tools, some techniques, some takeaways, uh, I'm, I'm gonna hopefully leave a little time for some Q&A from our audience as well. But what I'd like for you each to just take a moment. What brings you joy? What brings you a sense of belonging? What brings you a sense of your awareness? What brings you a sense of connection with family, with friends, with colleagues, with strangers? What brings you joy? Can I just start? I ain't on the panel, but can I just start? Please. If you have never seen the movie Black Panther, if you have never seen the movie Black Panther, uh, I own the video. Uh, I watch it every week. I'm, since it has come out, I watch it every week. Uh, Bravanel Hall hosted the Black Panther movie, and the symphony played the music to the movie. It was a life-changing experience. That brings me joy because in that particular movie, there were so many tips on how to belong, how to connect, how to show up, how to support, how to be heard, how to hear. There were so many takeaways in that movie that I'm t I watch it every week. I'm telling you, I, I need therapy. I understand that. <laughs> I understand that. But if there is something that brings you joy, how do you embed that into practices in your day-to-day -day life? What brings you joy? Um, about seven years ago, I, I uh, lost my baby boy. He was 13 years old. And uh, his name was Andrew Ardell Perry Dristam. And Andrew would, uh, he went to uh, Copper Mountain in Harriman. And he would run up to people at, the end of school and say, hey, are you doing okay? Are you doing all right? How are you doing? You doing okay? My name's Andrew. And the first day of school, uh, Miss Emma Houston, my barber called me and said, uh, do your kids go to uh, Copper Mountain? I said, uh, Andrew does. He said, well, there's this kid dancing in the middle of the parking lot. And there's like probably about five or 600 kids watching him and rooting. They're calling him Whip Boy because he was 
doing the whipping and nay nay, <laughs> you know. And uh, and I said that that sounds about right. He said he said, his name Andrew. I was like yeah. And uh, and I got and I said bro you made a you know I used to call him bro not you know not Andrew's son on the. I said, bro, you made a you made an impact today. He said, "Yeah, Dad, they love me, and you know, I just want to be myself. I just want to be myself." And so I learned from my child. I can learn from anybody, right? Uh, is be unapologetically who all the other spots are taken. Your spot is taken. Be unapologetically yourself, whatever that is. My mom used to tell me, she said, if you're going to be a bum, son, you better have the best tent on the street. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know? we grew up in Compton, you know, so we see all this, you know, people outside and washing the cars and running up to our cars. And we like, look, man, you know, stop, bro. We didn't ask for that. But um, be the best that you can be at the highest level that you can be at. Um, and if somebody doesn't understand and they truly want to know, just tell them. But, you know, the, um, I completely agree that, as somebody famous once said, that comparison is the thief of happiness. And so, you know, just, yeah, all you can do is be yourself. Um, things that bring me joy, I, I like saying hello just to people, like good morning in the hallway. <laughs> Half the time they're surprised and looking around <laughs> to see who else I'm talking to. Um, so that's kind of fun. And then um, I like making people laugh. So I am an introvert, but I, when I find something funny, like I'll point it out and make people laugh, and that always uh, does something. It changes the mood. Uh, laughter is, is very is cultural, I think. It's, it's something that we use to either deflect, but it can be something that brings us together. So um, yeah, so those are two things. Yeah. Um, probably a couple things that bring me Joy, I would say one is be unapologetically yourself. I, I want to, you know, you spend so much time trying to conform to what others want or what others see or what society says. But my, you know, I've and I've learned that it's it's a lot easier and you have a lot more fun and you have a lot more emotion uh, when you when you act yourself and you, you just bring your full self to the table, um, and then you can actually uh, inspire other people when you're when you when you when you spend more, less time focusing on. Uh, conforming, you can spend more time on on, on helping others and by helping yourself. Um, but what brings me joy? Um, I'll, I'll start there. Is um, I love to, and this might sound, but I, I love to help others. And what, what does that mean? I, whether it's just um, you know someone comes into the office and they they want to know how they get a must pass or how do I access this scholarship or hey hey bro my car's broken can I uh, can you give me a ride home or do you want to grab lunch? You know, I'm feeling down. Can you help me with this homework assignment? Whatever it is, or you know, making someone's day better, that has always made me smile and always made me feel good. Um, probably why I can't say no to anybody, but <laughs> which is a problem in itself. Um, but that's that's what gives me joy, and that makes me uh, it makes me want to continue what I do, and it makes me want to continue every day, knowing that uh, oh, I, I even if it's a small act of service, um, that that makes me feel better. Uh, well, thank you all for sharing what brings you joy. Uh, so your takeaways is that you will be clapping on campus, uh, in the classrooms, uh, and you will define what brings you joy, what brings you a sense of belonging. Uh, and I know that we are at 1259. I did not leave enough time for, for a Q&A, but if there is a burning question that you have for the panelists, does anyone have a burning question that you would like to pose to the panel? We can take that question. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? No. <laughs> Bueller. Could you please stand uh, and say your name uh, and speak into the microphone, please? Thank you so much. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Georgina. I go by Gina. I'm a second year in the microbiology and immunology PhD program, so I don't really get to come down to lower campus very often, so I really wanted to come to this event. Um, and I think me, just being Latina, my parents are immigrants from Mexico, um, and being in science, I see like so many people like me, but I also see how 
difficult it can be for people to trust in medicine, to trust in doctors, especially when the COVID vaccine came out. It's like, well, they just made this. How can I trust to take it? And how do you guys kind of navigate that? And like, did that affect any of you? And how can, I guess, medical professionals be better at being trusted more? That's something I think about a lot um, just going forward in my career. Thank you. Did you all hear that question? How can you create a space where voices are heard and medical is trusted? Trusted. I know we're out of time. I see Maddie right here. I see you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see. Any, well, I can, I, any, I can't, any comments yeah, on that? Uh, I can't speak to medical professions. Um, just if you're one thing I'll add, and I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, to my fellow panelists, but is, is if, if, you're any, if, any, if you have any, if you're in any position of power, if you have any power to make change, and, and whether that's you're a leader of a club or you know what, or you're an organization, whatever it is, always reach out to people, always show up, and always make that opportunity because trust is a hard thing to build. Um, but at minimum, by showing up and by by listening, that is the number one easiest way that you can start that process and start to build that trust. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, and thank you for the question as well. Um, to our wonderful panelists, thank you very much. <laughs> we, we're going to clap it up for them as well. Uh, and thanks to each of you for joining us in person and via our live stream for this special Reframing the Conversation, celebrating you completely, which you're going to find out all over the U this year. Uh, so please make sure that you join us for the next Reframing the Conversation on October 25th. We'll be part of our Metaversity Week. Uh, any additional details that you need, uh, www.diversity.utah.edu is our website. So again, thank you all for being present today, and thank you to our panelists.